Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Matt zoller -Seitz. I'm the television critic for New York Magazine and the editor-in-chief of RogerEbert.com. I'm really, really pleased to be moderating this panel. We have here with us three uh, cast members from Breaking Bad, and I'm going to welcome them up to the stage. Anna Gunn. R.J. RJ Mitty. <laughs> and last but not least, Mr. Bob Odenkirk. So I hope all the microphones are hot and working, yeah? Hot. There you go. <laughs> OK. So I'm going to ask, we'll start out by asking each of you individually, uh, how, did you, how did you end up on Breaking Bad? What's the story? Uh, I was, I had just had my second child um, five months before, and I was very, very tired, and um, I actually missed the meeting a couple of times because of being so tired, and uh, colds being passed around my house and things like that, and my very good friend Sharon Bialy, our um, amazing casting director, finally called me at home and said, what's your deal? Um, you, you, have you read the script? And I said, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm running around after these kids and I'm so tired. And she said, get, get off the phone and read the script right now. And so I did. And I read it and I thought it was one of the most brilliant scripts I'd ever read in my life. And I called her back and said, I will be there tomorrow. <laughs> RJ? Uh, yeah, I, um, ooh, yeah, it works. <laughs> um, no, I, I was, I was 14, I literally, I, I didn't start acting probably a year before, and um, I, I, I had so little training, and I, I really focused on this, and I had five auditions, actually, actually. I had four in Los Angeles and one in Albuquerque, and um, it just, it was incredible, and I was so lucky because everything in this character was like, this is you. My, my manager, everyone was like, this character was written for you, and the whole description was practically me. Big eyebrows, black hair, like <laughs> literally. I was like, yes, it, it's good, and he, he was lucky enough to, I, I was lucky enough that Vince um, wrote this character with a disability, and um, at the time, my uh, my speech was not as well as it is today, and um, it was it turned out being perfect. And I I was lucky. I, I actually I was the very last cast member um, to be cast for the family and for the pilot. Actually, um, everyone was previously there was a whole dinner yeah. that um, I was not a part of. Sadly enough, <laughs> uh, uh, but. Um, you came I, in under, I mean, I have to say that, yeah. that we were about to do our first table read in Albuquerque, yeah. and RJ came in and did his final audition with Brian and myself, and you were amazing under pressure <laughs> like that. I couldn't believe that this 14-year-old came in and did his final audition and got the part, and you, you were told right then and there that you got the part, um, and you came into the table well, read. not exactly, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, they told me we have... We have one other to look at. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I wanted to leave that. Yeah, out. Um, and it was De Niro. Yeah, <laughs> actually, it was. Um, it was the whole cast of um, pretty much anyone on Disney they were looking for. Um, <laughs> they, they they thought they could get away with paying me less. Um, <laughs> um, but no, it, it really it was. I was the very last cast member. I remember walking in and meeting Anna and Brian for the very first time. And um, walking up to my room and literally going to bed, 
I was so exhausted. I got in. I literally flew in that morning. I did the, my audition for Vince, and then I did the um, the test screen with Anna and Brian. And it, uh, I will definitely remember that day for the rest of my life. It was really just so amazing. And when you get to work and when you're in the room with these people, it's astonishing. <laughs> Now, Bob, you, you, uh, I remember watching you on Mr. Show, and I was as, <laughs> and I was telling him out in the lobby, I was a television critic for the Star Ledger when Mr. Show was on the air, and I actually got lectured by my editors for writing about Mr. Show too much. <laughs> um, and I was happy to see you on the show, but I wonder how, you know, given you have such yeah. a strong background in comedy, yeah. and you're funny on the show, but this is a very dark yeah. show. How did you end up on? I wondered the same thing for a long time. <laughs> I uh, I got a phone call from my agent, and he said, "There's a uh, they're going to ask you to do a part on a show, and you should say yes." <laughs> and uh, it's called Breaking Bad, and I was like, uh, "Okay, I've seen the billboards, but." Uh, whatever give me a minute and I called a friend I, I thought I'd call a couple friends and see if anybody had seen it and it was in its second season uh, it had started playing I feel like I might I'm not remembering this right but the way I remember it uh, the show was playing the second season was playing but you hadn't finished shooting because I was in like episode 9 10 11 well it would have been 10, 11, 12, and 13 was yeah, where they like wanted to use when you So is it possible that they started showing episode 201 when episode 210 hadn't been shot yet? Did they no, do that no, with no. those episodes? No. So what, what, it, so, 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 so then, so, but clearly so then my season memory. two hadn't started yet. No. Okay, so it was only season one. <laughs> my, I think my point anything. is that, my, my point is that uh, while I hadn't seen season one, it, it was only seven episodes long, right? And a lot of people hadn't seen it. It didn't, it, it snowballed this show a lot. So it didn't get a huge audience in season one. And, uh, and I was one of those people who hadn't seen it. And, uh, and I called a friend, just random, and the first guy I called was like, that's the best show on TV, you gotta do it. And uh, that was a great encouragement and I, uh, I said, uh, let me talk to this guy, Vince Gilligan, and he called me up, and he said, it's a sleazy lawyer, and his name's Saul Goodman, and I said, I think I can do that, and I go, I got an idea for his hair. Because <laughs> that's how those kinds of visual images come to you, you know, you, and, and also there's this thing with any part um, as a performer is that you want to make sure you're on the same page with that person who created it. So, like, I right away wanted to go, this is what I think he looks like, so if Vince said, no, there's no way, he could either tell me why he doesn't look that way or, or we could, you know, whatever, part ways. <laughs> you know, like, it, this is who I think he is. You know, right away you tell me that. This is who I think he is. He's got a mullet in back and he's got a comb over. <laughs> and, but it's business on the sides. And he's like, yeah, that looks good. That sounds good. I think that'd work. So uh, then he sent me the script and... Uh, the script was different than anything I'd ever gotten. I mean, I, Larry Sanders, I played an agent who, that show was very grounded in reality in its way. It's funny, but it's very kind of uh, quiet and subtle. And um, But Mr. Show was mostly pretty loony stuff. Um, I think with some characters that took a lot of commitment, I think the level of commitment you put into any film acting, um, but still really strong, intense, Creatures that were, you know, a l you know, drawn big, which is what you do in sketch comedy, and uh, so uh, anyhow, I got the script, and I thought it was amazing. It, it took a lot of work. It, it was a different thing, a different approach for me because of how it was written, and still, I expected to potentially show up in Albuquerque and be told, "You're Bob Odenkirk." <laughs> um, we wanted the other Bob Odenkirk, well, uh, I the was, actor one. I was. Uh, we were talking in the lobby before this, and uh, uh, about your character. And it's yeah. interesting that you and RJ should be seated next to each other because these are two of the only recurring characters on the show who aren't tormented. 
wow. you know, between where, sort of where they fall on the good and evil scale. And, uh, yeah. and, and in your character's case, he's a guy, he seems to sleep very well at night because he has no conscience at all. Right. <laughs> Whereas Walter... Better than melatonin. <laughs> Whereas Walt Jr. has has a conscience, but uh, I, I wanted to talk to all of you about that. Uh, you, you're on the show, but you're also fans of the show, yeah. and you watch the show, and you must have theories about the show. And let's just talk about the show, and you know, we'll get into the the characters as you play them, you know. But I just want to hear your theories about these characters that you play and about the show itself. Like that, you know, the thing that I was talking about mm. with you. Do you think that that Saul has any conscience at all? Uh, he he has a little bit of uh, humanity uh, still alive in him. Uh, you know, when he's with Jesse and he's tr trying to send Jesse in and encourage him to go see um, the woman and, and Brock, the girlfriend and Brock, you know, the kid. And there's a scene where Saul is really pushing Jesse to go in there and, and be with them because he can see how much uh, they want to see him and how much it's hurting Jesse. Um, outside of that moment, which is, uh, was great and fun to play and, uh, interesting, um, Saul's only real, uh, human f empathy comes with, uh, empathizing with himself. Is that possible? <laughs> what is that called? When you, it's called, oh, selfishness? I did, I did, get, <laughs> I did uh, get a laugh watching one of the episodes that they showed before this panel. It's, it's from, uh, I think, season four. Mm. And I think everyone has stopped wearing the, the memorial the ribbons ribbon. except for Saul. I love that. I love the that. The one so person much. who doesn't care. I, I know. Exactly. Is wearing the ribbon still. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. You know, I don't want to be too harsh on the fellow, but he, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys like that. A lot of a lot of businessmen. I think a lot of Wall Street guys and a lot of people in all endeavors. And uh, they're just uh, playing a game. Life is a game, and their business is a game, and the people around them are pawns in the game. And the goal of the game is to make money. And uh, you know, there's that thing of like, uh, if they they hurt somebody or do anything damaging, they kind of feel like, well, sorry, didn't mean to. And they feel like that's a good enough apology. And the same, but I mean, some of these guys who you meet like that in the world, they really do feel that way. If they're, if they get the shit end of the deal, sorry, if they get the bad end of the deal, uh, <laughs> this is Lincoln Center. Uh, <laughs> You know, they, they'd be like, ah, I lost. I hate you. Okay, forget it. Let's do another deal. You know? Saul they, does that, It really though. is just a game. You know what I mean? Saul, and so, Saul himself does that, though, in yeah. the way he, he will, you know, say incredibly hurtful things to people and then add, just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, he kinda, and he is just kidding. It, it, but all of life is just a game to him. But see, it's not a game to the other characters on the show in this story. They're, they're really in danger. They're really going to lose everything. And and uh, and then of course in the fifth season, Saul is also uh, has has high stakes and is in trouble. R.J., how do you play a character who is, for the bulk of the series, in the dark about his dad's true nature? Yeah, is that know, rough? It it's a little hard not to pretend that he's knowing, but at the end of the day, he is a kid. He is he's seeing only so many sides of his his family. And I, I don't know if a lot of people, when they were kids, went through divorces and went through just very interesting times dealing with your family. But a lot of times, the kids have no idea until it hits. And when it does hit, that's when the kids finally start realizing that, oh, this is, this is real. And I think that's the thing with Walt Jr. because he is going to school. He is living his own life. He's, he's going out with Lewis. He's hanging out. He's... He's still, yeah. <laughs> Lewis, yeah. We, we we just call him Lewis. There's a there's a whole there's a whole another spinoff to that, but uh, <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> uh, no. It's if you think about it, I um, he he really he's more concerned. I know if you, is everyone caught up or? 
Like, I, I'm going to, if not, all right, I hear, like, one, two, like, a couple of claps. Good. We're going to ruin, <laughs> we're going to ruin some things for you then. Um, no, like, when his parents did separate, that was tr literally traumatizing to him. How would any young adult feel they're losing their family? He's hearing fights. He's hearing all kinds of things going on, and he thinks it's gambling and chemo and cancer. And honestly, to any normal family, that's plenty enough on top of methamphetamine and, <laughs> and Mexican mafia and cartel and all that. It, it really, when it gets down to it, this kid is just trying to be a kid and live his life and trying to keep his family all there. There's an extraordinary moment in one of the episodes that they showed before this where he goes over to his dad's condo, I guess, <laughs> and he's in bed beaten up and it's uh, he missed uh, his son's birthday party and he, he goes through this long monologue about the only memory he has of his father and then he apologizes to Walt Jr. and Walt actually says, at least last night you were real. Yeah. Oh, what a great scene. No, that was, that great was yeah, scene. Really such amazing and Brian was really amazing and we, we shared stories about, um, he was telling me about um, one of his family members when he was going through something similar to that. And um, I, I definitely, I remember when, um, when my grandfather was on his deathbed and it's just, it's hard when you, when you have so much love for someone and you're watching them just being eaten alive by the inside and by this cancer, literally. And he thinks it's still cancer. He thinks he has an idea, but he doesn't truly know. And it, it's, it's really, it's one of those things where you're just like, oh my God, what more could happen to this family? <laughs> it's like, really? Well, and well An Anna is playing uh, that, that conflict I think really um, that's embodied in her performance almost more than anyone on the show with the exception of, of Walt, of Walter. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about that? I mean, that the, the, and, and also just the, the perception of her as being somehow this uh, uh, speed bump standing in the way of Walter and his success. Yeah, yeah, it's a, that's a mild way to put it. Well, you know, <laughs> it's Lincoln Center. I know, it's Lincoln Center, exactly. Um, it, 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 it was a fascinating journey, I think, and 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 I, the the my journey with playing Skylar was was really interesting because it took a while for me to really understand her, and it took a while for Vince and I to really um, come to an understanding together about who she was. Um, I am a much more overtly emotional person, and so when I was first approaching her and she was finding out just about his cancer, for example, in the beginning, um, I would uh, just in intuitively start, tears would jump to my eyes. And Vince very specifically wanted Skylar to be a very, very strong person with a backbone of steel. That's really what he wanted her to be from the beginning. He had a vision of her being somebody who was formidable and somebody who was very, very held together. And when I started to understand those pieces of her, then I started to really put that person together. Um, I, I failed to mention that when I, when I auditioned for the show, um, I wanted to know a little bit more about the character before I went in. Um, because I w I, I, there wasn't a lot about Skylar and the pilot. And so I had a conversation with Vince on the phone and I asked him about the character and he said, I can tell you this, she'll be Carmela Soprano, but she'll be in on the crime. And, <laughs> and I just, that, I said, okay, sold. <laughs> and, and that was it. And I, I didn't know how it would happen or when or where, and I didn't need to know, but I knew that somehow that would happen someday. Um, and I couldn't tell anybody that either, so I had to keep that to myself. But, <laughs> um, but I did know that that would happen, and so I knew that, some, I, what I knew about her was that her intellect matched that of Walt's, that, that Brian and I decided between each other that, that that was probably the thing that, above all, really drew them together. And that when she, found, when she finds out that he is 
involved in this whole thing. And she decides not to turn him in to the police. Mm -hmm. And she decides not to run away. And she decides to stay. And she decides to get involved. She thinks that her intellect can actually fix things. Yes. She, and she is that kind of person. And he creates her in that way from the beginning. She's the kind of person who pushes the emotion down and who actually holds herself so tightly together because she thinks she can, <laughs> if she controls external things, then everything will be OK. And that's, yeah. that is, that's who she is. Well, that moment with Ted where she, she, she stops and, and suddenly says, I gave you, I gave you the money. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of all those moments when Walter could walk away from a, s a situation before it becomes really bad. Right. And he does walk away, and then he stops, and he turns around, and he cannot resist twisting the knife, confronting somebody. And exactly. in that moment where you know, between uh, uh, Skylar and Ted, I, 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 this bizarre line popped into my head, which is what dear Abby would always say, uh, reader, I married her. You know, right. I mean, like that's what it looked like. It's like you see in Skylar, oh, this is what drew her and Walt together. Is Absolutely. that she's kind of similar to him, maybe. She is. I think that that they really, really have parallels to each other. And I didn't know that at the beginning, but I started to see that. We got to see a, a pilot. Um, they did a reading of the pilot um, that Jason Reitman uh, does these live readings, and they did it at LACMA. in L.A. Right? In L.A. And they did it at LACMA last week, and it was the first time that I had seen. I mean, I hadn't seen the pilot episode in years. I, ha I certainly hadn't read it um, for years. And, and to be able to sit back and have that perspective and to be able to see the seeds that he planted. And I could see the, I could see the progression. I could see those people starting in that place and ending up where we all ended up. Speaking of her, her, her intellectual capacity and pride, I, now I need to ask you a question that somebody asked me to ask you on Twitter. Which is, uh, if Schuyler wrote short fiction, what would it be like? Oh. Um, well, that's interesting, because in the pilot, I actually asked Vince what Schuyler might be doing at home, um, because I felt like she should be doing something at home all day. Um, and we talked about it, and I wanted her to be a writer, because, again, I felt like she was similar to Walt in that she was somebody who had had her dreams deferred and she was a disappointed person and that they were both just kind of getting along in life. And so we came up with the, uh, the idea that she was a, sh a short story writer. I think she would write sort of very painful, dark fiction <laughs> um, uh, along the lines of uh, probably, you know, Raymond Carver or um, I don't know, something like, uh, I, I think Flannery O'Connor, I, I don't know, something like that. It just, I, I think she's, she puts all of her, I think she's probably somebody who puts all that torment that's inside of her that she can't let out, that she puts it probably into her, qu into her writing. A, qu a question for everybody, given the given the level of interest in what happens next, like this is a show that's so driven by what happens next. Um, what do they do to maintain secrecy? How do you how do you uh, n like keep these plot twists to yourself and not? I mean, are you allowed to tell your significant others? I mean, do they make you sign something? What do they do? Uh, we'll be shot on sight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they send out emails every couple of weeks reminding you to keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they uh, did, they, did we sign something at the I beginning of the season? Like no, we didn't sign. There's anything, a paper though that you read. It, they they actually sent out emails, and I remember reading paper copies of that. Yeah. Um, so they remind you, like, yeah. remember, keep your mouth shut. You, people want you know want to be surprised, and yeah. um, and then at the end of the season, the last three or four episodes, they they black out plot uh, in in the dialogue or action. Yeah. So, really? you in scenes that you're in, or in scenes that you're not in, the whole thing. Uh, yeah. I, I guess scenes that you're in, they would tell you what it is, yeah. but <laughs> but eventually scenes that you're, you know, they just do that. I was just, an English major. They, they just do that with the last three or four scripts, and then and then that's the script that goes out, and then um, and then I suppose if you're, I mean, I've never been in a scene that had blackouts in it. You probably were. I, I, I was in a couple, So yeah. how do they handle that? They, the, when they first send the script out, they black it out, and then eventually you'll get a copy or you'll get sides that have the actual, that has the actual dialogue or the actual thing that's going on. Now, so for it's me... Like, it's like reading a classified document. Yeah, or yes. I did not read the parts of the last episode and a half that I'm not in. 
because I don't want to know how it ends until I see it, because I, I'm a fan of the show. <laughs> <laughs> As of last year, no, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, uh, I, I really am. I really want to see see it end with everybody. Do you? Did you guys read the last? Did you? Well, yes. Yeah, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really wanted to know. <laughs> but I, I find I. It's still new when you watch it. You know, well, it is right. Then, yeah. Knowing. Yeah, it is. When people ask me, I I don't want to tell them. I don't tell anyone. Well, no, I I would no, say yeah. now my experience with the audience in this week <laughs> and a half, two weeks of promotion is that people are like, don't tell me. They'll joke, tell me, and then they'll say, don't tell me, because they <laughs> the audience really wants to experience this. Yeah. 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 I just say randomly horrible things about everything that <laughs> happens. <laughs> just anything you could think of. What have you told people not about this season, but about other seasons? Um, that it was all a dream that we wake up on the island. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I tell them everyone's dead. Um, uh, Jesse and Walt are lovers. Um, oh <laughs> I, that <laughs> that baby Holly dies. <laughs> I I I I probably I reacted should just not. like his mom there. I, <laughs> I should probably not keep going because I've said some really horrible things <laughs> about that happened. And the show you're like, describing sounds a lot like Six Feet Under. Actually. <laughs> I sadly I've yet to see that. <laughs> but um, no, it's I don't think people want to know. No. No. Do y'all want to know really? <laughs> well, there you have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is do do you uh, are you able to? Uh, I remember a conversation I had years and years ago with James Gandolfini in about season three or four of The Sopranos. He was in negotiations to continue, and the assumption was that he was just holding out for more money, and he was. But it was enough money to convince him that it was worth the psychological pain of having to play this guy. And he said, and he was very very honest. He said, I can't. He said, no matter. How long I spend in the shower and how much soap I use, I can't wash the stink of this guy off of me. Yeah, I wonder how. Which is pretty how, deep. And I, do you I ever wonder feel how that? you feel. I, my character is fun to play, and he, he, when I take the yellow socks off, I'm done with them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I wonder how you guys feel. Uh, I think Anna, especially you, uh, you have such intense scenes. RJ, you've had some really intense scenes as well. But Anna, especially where your character's gotten to. Um, I, I certainly look at Brian and, and imagine as Brian is, you know, a joker and he's uh, a lighthearted guy, but it's got to wear on you to play these scenes. It, there are days when I, I, the residual emotions, certainly it stays with you. And um, but having children has helped a lot because I I really do have to go home and be present for my kids and so that helps a lot because I cannot take that intensity and heaviness home that would not be pleasant for them or good for them so um, I, I've learned to to change hats as it were and um, but there are times when I've noticed that it it is sh she's a she's a, a heavy person to play and and I, I realized actually when we wrapped when I had my final day I there was a lot of sadness with saying goodbye to this experience but I drove home and it felt like an enormous weight had been lifted off my shoulders because it was a very very um, painful character to play and a very painful story to tell but also as an actor you wait for a story like this to tell at the same time. So there's a lot of mixed emotions with it. I, uh, we have uh, time for just a little bit more, and so I wanted to ask you, um, as fans of the show, can, can each of you maybe name one or two moments where, as a, just as a fan, you said, wow. My God, so many moments, oh, yeah. really. It's just an astounding thing to watch and be surprised. Did you see that promo reel? It's up on YouTube for the fifth season. Ozymandias, that one? Is it, I don't know what it's called. Is that what it's called? Uh, Brian is reading the. He's reading the Percy B. Shelley poem. Or are you talking about a different one? Oh, I think it's a different one. It's the oh. one for this season. They just put it up oh, like two weeks ago. Yes, that one. It's yeah. so intense. The images and there's so many things in it, and you're just like one after another, like whoa, no, right, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's like 
I mean, you can't believe that they packed all that in. But I would say I just watched Box Cutter. My wife and I watched Box oh Cutter. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> that was, you remember when we first watched that yeah. at the premiere and yeah. somebody fainted? And yes. They had, to yeah. call, oh. they had to call a paramedic. They had to yeah. stop showing the, sh the, the, the show yeah. and, and take her to medical. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. But watching it again, you guys know what I'm talking about. That scene is unbelievable. And I'm, I'm struck by how, you know, the gory it is, and that's unbelievable. But the, the, the way you experience it watching it and the way you experience it through uh, Jesse and Walter and Mike. Yeah. You guys remember what Mike does in that scene? Gus grabs that guy and cuts him. And Mike's got a gun. Mike goes like this. <laughs> He aims a gun at Gus. He doesn't know what to do. He's just like so taken out of himself, and every and then it's an it, it feels like s such a long time, but it's it's got to be a long screen time. It's you four just, or five minutes that built the build up to that. It, it but really then takes also you just watch yeah. those three guys just in shock for you know on screen just in shock. Yeah. For a long extended period and that you just Gian don't see. Yeah. And what Giancarlo does with the precise nature of every single thing he does, and you, you think, oh my God, this is not good. Whatever is coming is <laughs> not good. It's not going to be good. I remember just one, the one d scene that I shared was Giancarlo, where I was sitting in the um, hospital waiting room. And seeing him on screen is so intense, but seeing him in person, just being this close to him and watching his body language, you know, the way he was always coiled like yeah. a panther a, that was about to strike, that, ma that scared me in, <laughs> uh, so much in person that I was, I was just, and I wasn't supposed to know who he, you know, or any, I just, but I just sat there watching him working and it was one of my favorite days actually on set. I mean, I, I, I just was amazed to watch how he barely moved a muscle and his eyes were so laser focused everywhere he looked. It was extraordinary to watch him. It was really an exciting day. Yeah, it, yeah he is <laughs> so amazing. I, I remember my scene with him too at um, at Los Polos Hermanos with oh, that's Dean, right. yeah, right, right. we got to, we got to eat some chicken. <laughs> um, uh, he, but every scene I've ever been a part of and have watched being filmed and made, really, y'all have no idea. Y'all, y'all see it on the screen, but you have no idea what it's like to be in these in the room watching this take place. It's it's really, it's one of the most amazing experiences of my life, being able to watch this show be made. I remember I, um, coming to set even when, when I uh, wasn't working and watching some of these scenes and just being in complete shock and just being like, oh my God, I, I, I read the script. And when you read these scripts, you see it in front of your eyes. You really do. But actually watching it unfold in front of you, behind the camera, and everything that's going into it is just, it's truly remarkable. It really is. You know, I was, I, I, I found myself at times <laughs> with, uh, oh, I can't talk about the scene. But um, <laughs> some, it happened more than once, but recently on the recent round where the other person in the scene is so intense and so uh, locked in and uh, that I begin to watch it as a viewer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm acting, but I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, I'm Saul. Okay. Uh, you got to, come on, wake up, buddy. You're getting paid, you're getting paid to do this. Well, that, that, that seems like a, a good enough a place as any to stop, and we do have to stop because we've got two more episodes and another wow. panel to go. But thank cool. you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thanks for watching. Thank you.